Welcome, Dr. Tharoor. Thank you so much for talking to the Quint. And my first question to you is uh, on India and China, current standoff, as it is being called, along the line of actual control. How do you see it? Well, I think this has gone beyond what we are used to of, you know, differing perceptions of the LAC, uh, the Chinese occasionally patrolling where we think it's our land and us occasionally patrolling where they claim it's theirs. These have all been locally diffused uh, for the last 44 years since a, the shot was fired in anger in 1976. There's been a fairly tranquil border and the military have been able to settle any misunderstandings very amicably uh, over the years. This has gone into a totally different level. And what worries us is, is first of all, the fact that uh, the Chinese seem to be moving thousands of troops into the Galwan Valley area and the, uh, the Pangong So Lake area, um, which raises real questions about all the government's claims of India's territorial integrity. Um, and I think there's a real question the government has to face. Have the Chinese troops occupied what is unambiguously Indian territory in those two areas? Uh, have they, in other words, crossed into our territory even beyond China's own claim line? because every indication from satellite imagery and media reports, and I'm obviously relying only on media reports, is that they have pitched hundreds of tents, they've constructed concrete structures, they've even built a few kilometers of road along the LAC in the Galwan River Valley and on the north bank of the Pangong So Lick. So this is fairly serious, and I must say that the Chinese troops, um, if they have occupied the finger heights near the lake, that would be an unprecedented development. Don't forget there's one larger concern I have here, we all have here, which is that the Chinese transgressions into the Galwan River Valley would not just be a question of us losing a few kilometers of territory, uh, which is bad enough, but it would threaten the operation of a very key road, the Darbuk Shiok Dolat Beg Oldi Road, the DSDBO Road as it's often called, which is vital to servicing Indian troops uh, in the subsector of the North and the Karakoram Pass. And as a result, it, it almost acquires the strategic significance of Kargil, where the Pakistanis occupied the heights and were in a position to cut off a major road for Indians. Now, the government had, keeps talking about territorial integrity of India, national security of India, and so on. I remember Mr. Modi in the 2014 campaign decrying what he saw as the government's passivity with China and saying that if I come to Paham, la lanke de kange will show red eyes to the Chinese. Uh, there's no sign of eyes even being... Uh, a mild pink so far. Um, but at the same time, it's also clear that military level attempts to defuse this have not uh, succeeded. And so the question that comes up is, are, is diplomacy gaining ground? I was very concerned to see for the first time that yesterday, Monday, both the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and the Russian government broke their silence on the saying that they're worried about this uh, ongoing standoff. And, uh, and that according to the US, China has moved its forces up along the LAC. And, and to my mind, uh, it's important that uh, the prime minister needs to speak up on China to the nation. I'm not suggesting that he can conduct diplomacy on social media or on the mass media or on television. That is not possible. Diplomacy must be done behind closed doors. But he must reassure the nation. He must take the nation into confidence and say, listen, uh, this is what's happening. Don't worry about it. Matters are in hand. We're talking to the Chinese. Uh, we believe that this can be cleared up, whatever it may be. Uh, but on the specific issues that are already in the public domain, the lack of clear messaging from the government is undermining the public's confidence, in my mind, uh, on this. But why don't we seem to trust uh, what the defense minister said on this issue? Well, first of all, since he said it, there's been more progress or, or, or regression, if you like, in terms of the situation getting worse. Since he said it, we've seen continued troop buildup, the conversion of, of, of a, a Chinese patrols into our presence for the pitching of tents and possibly even the construction of concrete shelters, uh, development of a road on the LOC, LAC. So uh, if at all the reassurance that was meant to be conveyed was to be accepted at that time, let's have no doubt that uh, the disquieting elements have continued since that statement. Uh, besides, his was the only statement we have not heard from the prime minister uh, or, 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 the, or the military on this matter. But would you, would you also agree that uh, drumming up a hysteria and demanding uh, a minute-by-minute -minute progress on what is happening between India and China would, might create a situation that may force the country's leadership into a, into a foolhardy sort of uh, um, step? 
Well, the country's leadership ought to be beyond being pressed by either the opposition or the media on a certain point of, of national interest. Certainly, we had the hysteria after 2611 with various anchors screaming for bombing Pakistan, and our prime minister took a firm stand that was not in India's interest, and his view is what prevailed. So, I mean, I, I respect the prime minister's right to make his own decisions as long as he's the prime minister. But he also has a duty to the voters who put him there and made him prime minister, and that duty is to just at least give them a clear signal. As I said repeatedly, we have no business expecting him to conduct his negotiations with China in public. He should not do that because it'll tie his hands unnecessarily. He should conduct negotiations in the diplomatic chancelleries and behind closed doors. But given what's already in the public domain, given what we're hearing in public statements from other governments, the US and Russia recently, given what the Chinese themselves have said publicly and given what our media is reporting daily, it's bizarre that our prime minister chooses not to reassure the nation. That's my concern. Right. And uh, there's one thing that I want to ask. Uh, as a former diplomat, does it worry you that, um, you know, third party interventions are now becoming par for the course, or at least the, the offer to mediate, they are becoming par for the course, even though we say that, oh, we do not want any mediation? Yeah, well, I, I don't take Mr. Trump terribly seriously. I have to say he, he's trigger happy with mediation. I think some People have been joking he's desperate for a Nobel Peace Prize on, on any excuse because Mr. Obama got one. So there he goes when Imran Khan visits Washington. He says, we'll mediate on, on Kashmir. The moment this trouble happened with China, he says, we'll mediate on China. A, I don't think India particularly welcomes mediation. B, Mr. Trump isn't the right person. Uh, certainly with China, he has his own issues. And C, um, he, his style of, of, of conversation is not going to be particularly helpful in mediating any dispute. He's, He's better, I think, at inflaming disputes than at mediating them. So I don't think we need to take that all very seriously. Um, it would be a, an astonishing admission of desperation for India to welcome mediation by anybody on anything, and I don't think we're going to go that route. We are capable, it seems to me, of dealing with this effectively ourselves. How do you see this aggression on the part of China and um, you know how they have actually opened quite a few fronts particularly in the aftermath of this, uh, uh, you know, the spread of coronavirus, COVID-19 coronavirus. So is China feeling a bit uh, singled out diplomatically and wants to assert its might? I think there's an element of that, Nishtha, you're right, because there's been a lot of move towards, quote unquote, decoupling from China. You may remember the Japanese announced a $2 billion fund uh, to encourage Japanese companies to leave China and relocate back to right. Japan. Another $250 million for those who couldn't relocate to Japan, but were willing to go to third countries. So there's this desire now to reduce dependence on China because China is seen as an untrustworthy, secretive country that will even have a virus and lie about it instead of saving the rest of the world and so on. Uh, China does have a serious problem. And they've tried to overcome that with many steps, uh, the most uh, effective of which has been their generous assistance to countries, for example, in Europe, Italy and Serbia have benefited from medicines, from doctors, from uh, uh, protective equipment, all sorts of things the Chinese have been sending either on loans or gifts to these countries. Uh, and that's, that kind of checkbook diplomacy often works very well. The countries are grateful to get help when they're in crisis. Secondly, the Chinese have also at the same time started their factories humming. They've said, we are over the worst. The virus right. has been eradicated thanks to our effective measures. Now we're ready to, to manufacture for the world again. And they're, they're, they're obviously way ahead of anybody else in reviving their, their manufacturing and their economy. And third, you're right, they seem to be asserting themselves wherever they can. South China Sea, they've asserted themselves. Border with India, they're asserting themselves. With Hong Kong, they've just passed a new national security law right. and they're asserting themselves. Uh, Taiwan may well be next. So there is at the same time, uh, a part of a sort of third prong of their strategy appears to be uh, a certain assertiveness. But whereas Hong Kong can do nothing about it because they are still a part of China, we are not, and we can certainly stand up for ourselves. And that's where I hope the government will do so. I have enough faith in our diplomacy and our military that they can stand up effectively for Indian national interests. I just want the, the elected government to show leadership and to communicate with the people of India. And people can always boycott Chinese goods. I mean, this is a constant refrain. Whenever a relationship between India and China gets sour, everybody wants to ban Chinese goods. Do you think it is either practical or effective? 
No, I, I, I don't think it's either practical or effective. It's not practical because the Chinese are actually, um, are actually very, very um, involved in, in our economy. Uh, they're trading with us that, you know, about $69 billion coming from them to us. And not all of it is in sort of small rubber slippers we're buying in the shops or whatever. A lot of it is capital goods and investments that factories and big businesses and industries are using. And those can be got rid of very easily. Uh, secondly, uh, helping China develop an economic stake in India may be in our interest if we want to uh, reduce the premium on any adventurism. Because the more they have at stake within India, then the less uh, good an argument it would be for somebody in the PLA to say, let's march and take the long tomorrow or whatever. Because if they tried that stunt, uh, they would be jeopardizing billions of dollars of Chinese investments in India. So there's, a, there's an objective argument for encouraging more Chinese investment, not less. Uh, there's a, there was a joke going around about this man who presents himself nude at his office, saying he took off everything that was made in China. I mean, that's, that's how widespread Chinese products are here. Uh, and there's also, also the perception that, um, that uh, even if we wanted to have uh, stickers made or T-shirts made saying boycott Chinese goods, those T-shirts and stickers would themselves have to be made in China. So let's, let's, let's move back from, from that kind of talk. I think it's fairly fatuous. Gesture politics never gets you anywhere. Substantive right. policy making is what really matters. Sure. Thank <coughs> you so much for your um, wonderful views on diplomacy and India-China relationship. Thank you very much for talking to us, Dr. Tharoor.